from Microbe TV. This is TWIP. This week in Parasitism, episode 122, recorded on December 6th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free. If you sign up at CuriosityStream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This show is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. This holiday season, give someone a Drobo to keep all their files and memories safe forever. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me here in New York City, my two fine colleagues, Dixon de Pommier and Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent and Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. No, that was nice. Like, we all got introduced at the I'll same time. I like that. We should, we I should like do that. He got confused. He didn't know what happened. Well, I just had to do them sequentially. That's <laughs> it, it wasn't the fact that you mentioned us both. It was the fact that you referred to him as a fine colleague. Fine colleague. So right. Was... I was taken aback. <laughs> <laughs> you have a bad back? I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's... Since, for how long? About a week back? Yeah, something like that. Uh, you, I own gentlemen. a Drobo, by the way, so I, I appreciate the fact that you're still... Um, associated with that company because I, I enjoy my Drobo. Quote. They wanted a one-time ad at the beginning of December, ready for the holiday season. Just one, mm-hmm. and this is it. Okay, Great. and we're going to tell you all about the deal you can get on your Drobo a bit later. Right, right here. Uh-huh. Stay they, tuned. They right. Big, Do you nice stay discount. tuned? It's like an old expression. There's no <laughs> tuning. There's no tuning. No. Stay clicked stay in. Stay clicked in. I don't know. <laughs> Well, stay just listen, listen to the whole episode. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So it's been a few weeks since yes. we last recorded, right? That's true. And Daniel has been in the Dominican Republic, Haiti. Well, I've been in Western, the Western Dominican Republic in a little town um, called Restauracion, which is mm. just a few miles from the Haitian border. I was mainly there, but also in the, in the general area. I was up in Dahaban, which is a border town, and then a lot of these little villages up in the mountains how do you pick where you're going to go there yeah that's a good question actually you know that so where i'm going to go in the dominican republic where i'm going to go in the world that too <laughs> there. No, I'm actually, I'm actually, sometimes you go to thailand sometimes you go to peru dominican republic that's right do you it's, rotate <laughs> no this you know, so I, it, this is a, a very timely question i'll say because this morning on the way in during my wonderful um, commute mm-hmm. I was uh, typing up a little bit of a blog for the organization I went with and really addressing that. How did I pick this organization? How did I pick this part of the world? And uh, I I went with an organization called um, FIMRIC, or Foundation International Medical Relief for Children. And, um, you you know, different things. Sometimes it's I want to go to that particular part of the world and I look to see who's Mm -hmm. doing work there. Um, In this case, I was looking at what organization do I want to work with, what organization embraces the, the values that, that I have sort of developed over the years of doing global health and, and thinking through these. And so in this case, it started off with an interest in this particular organization, um, which I really think brings, um, I, I think, my values. They, they, I share the same values that they share. Sure, who shares with whom, but mm-hmm. we're sharing them. <laughs> we have the same. Um, but they go to different parts of the world. And the first thing they do is they meet the local people and they say, hey, what can we do to help? So they, they come with this humility, this um, mm. this interest in cooperating with local people yeah, instead of go. the, hey, we're here and we're going to make it all better. That's right. Yeah, right. Um, and then the services they provide in different areas are based upon what the, the people um, – need what they perceive they need Mm. and so that was the first just identifying what i think is an outstanding organization Mm -hmm. and then second i talked to them a bit about you know you've got a place in uganda you've got a site in um, dominican republic uh, about 10 different places throughout the world and with such a large dominican population here in washington Mm -hmm. heights Mm -hmm. i thought you know it would be great to see 
where a lot of these people are from, where a lot of people are going back and forth, learn more about the culture there, Mm -hmm. um, hopefully make a difference while I'm there, but also learn enough that I can make a difference when I come back, um, take care of patients here. So what is your overall impression of the Dominican Republic? I really liked it. I mean, this was actually, I'd say to date, my my favorite overseas experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everywhere I go, people are great. Um, and the people in the Dominican Republic were just fantastic. I was just joking with one of my colleagues in the lab that I had to be careful, like how I would walk home. Um, I was staying with this family, um, which was great. Um, but I had to be careful because people would be trying to feed me, whether it was fried chicken or fried plantains or come in and have tea. I mean, it was, everybody was just so, I mean, they had so little, but whatever they had, they, they were sharing. They were so generous. Uh, it, it was a great experience. I mean, there's an incredible amount of poverty, which is yeah, always a right. challenge. And um, I think the one story that I've been relaying that really sort of touched me was um, here are these um, – young kids that they're helping to educate to be these health um, Mm -hmm. sort of instructors to go out and teach other people. And they're talking to them about emotions, you know, because they're young, they're teenagers at this point going through the program. And they said, you know, sadness, you've all experienced sadness. What, What makes you sad? And the number one answer that just breaks your heart was, when I'm hungry and my family has no food. Mm, interesting. I mean, so really a, a tough, impoverished part. Of course, that's why so many of them come here to New York to try and have a better life, right? There's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah. That's true. And when we took a taxi to the Bronx Zoo, remember our driver was in the DR. He said he, he's lived here most of his life, though. Yep. That's very common. Yep. So I hope you picked up some new cases. I did, and actually, I'm going to I'm going to share. I'm going to the next few episodes. Nice. We'll do a Wonderful. little um, nice. bit of sharing about some cases that I saw. Do you have now. any other trips this this year? Um, you know, I'm, I people ask like, do you travel a lot? I realize, oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> every month. And, uh, think a, about a couple you. <laughs> a couple of weeks, I go to Japan, and then after that, I'm in Puerto Rico, and then I need to like probably actually stay in the U.S. for a while. <laughs> Well, it's good for I got to go to that parasitology museum when I'm in Japan. And exactly. a, yeah, you should. And a, in fact, uh, someone sent us some pictures today. Yeah, excellent. Uh, of the parasitology museum. Lots yes. of worms. Right. Lots of worms. And they're in the show notes. They're very photogenic. I mean, the protozoans, you'd have to probably use a microscope, right? Yeah, yeah. the things they had in jars, though, you could see. Yeah, and they've got some animal tapeworms. They'll just knock your socks. I was in Tokyo. My family didn't want to go. <laughs> You well, actually, <laughs> you you raised it's not hard to you, understand. You raised them wrong. <laughs> no, I, I mean, when I you're on have vacation, said, you probably don't want to look at Paris. I didn't want to go off on my own, but I'm on vacation with my family, right? <laughs> exactly. But my son goes, I want to go to the sword museum, so I went with him. I didn't particularly want to, although it was fascinating yeah. in yeah. the end. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. What if I'd said to him, I want to go to the Parasite Museum? He would have said, go ahead, see you later. You enjoy yourself. <laughs> so I wasn't going to go on my own, but another Don't time. Don't get hurt. Well, no, my kids have made a list of where they want to go, and I'm pretty sure, like, you know, a parasite few of, yeah, the, the Parasite of Museum list. is at the top. <laughs> well, Studio Ghibli should be at the top, too. Actually, yes. Because it was closed for renovations while we were there, the whole three weeks. Oh, wow. that's And Studio Ghibli, of course, Dixie, you don't know what Studio Ghibli is, no. but it is a studio by a very well-known animator. See. Right. Uh, Hayao Miyazaki, uh-huh. who has done many, many movies like okay. like Howl's Moving Castle. Fantastic movie. Spirit, I recommend it. Spirited Away. Again, excellent. Tons, tons. All over your head? Sorry. Never seen them. Um, it's all right. That doesn't mean I won't. You won't. You won't see them and you won't read them either. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. Let's go to our taste from last time. Daniel, I don't okay. know if you remember. Vaguely, <laughs> the in past. but us. fortunately, you know we have we have these show notes that Vincent puts together. <laughs> we do we do, we do. <laughs> which I can read plus all the answers <laughs> that'll remind me too. Right. Now I, I I remember this woman um, well. This is a fifty fifty year fifty five year old female. We're back in Peru, and this woman is from the Highland Central Valley area near Cusco. Uh, she works in farming. Um, she's still working. She she tells us that she has no prior skin lesions, but when we examine her, we saw multiple hypopigmented scars on the exposed extremity. She says, "Oh, I you know must have hurt myself while working." And now she comes in reporting years <laughs> of bloody nasal discharge. Um, she's seen in Lima in the outpatient clinic there, 
And uh, actually, I think when I was looking through some of the emails in one of the clinics where one of our um, listeners Mm -hmm. had spent some time. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had no other medical problems, no surgeries, no allergies. Everyone in the family um, is fine. She tells us, husband, kids, um, mentioned she is still working. No travel except staying in this local region and now coming down to Lima to see the doctor. And uh, we we looked in the right nary, and I actually showed uh, showed a picture. I, I was having trouble getting a really good picture of this, but there is an ulcerated lesion inside the nose, um, and I describe this as a mucocutaneous lesion. Uh, and um, we're going to do a simple test um, to decide what this is. Uh, but I did also give a few other bits of information: no anemia, no fever, no eosinophilia. Her labs were normal, and she was HIV negative. Right. All right. We had a bunch of guesses because it's been a couple of weeks. We did. Or also probably because this was easier. Carl writes, Dear Twipnicks, it's a beautiful, sunny, crisp New England full day here in Lexington, Massachusetts. Thank you for releasing your book as a free PDF. I've been reading it with great interest and some horror. (laughs) <laughs> Unlike most of your correspondence, I have no medical or biological experience whatsoever. My degree is in electrical engineering, and I now write statistical software for a living. However, having read your book and with the help of Google, I will now attempt a diagnosis of the case of the week. The Peruvian woman with bloody nasal discharges suffering from mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. The hypopigmented scars on her exposed areas are healed cases of cutaneous leishmaniasis, one of which is the original entry point of the parasites now affecting, afflicting her nasal mucosa. The first stage treatment is sodium stivoglucanate or other pentavalent antimony compound. There's, this is much more effective against leishmania brasiliensis than against L. mexicana, and I don't know which one she has. It is also possibly a resistant strain, although this is usually only found in India or in a patient that has already received a course of antimonials. If a course of antimonials doesn't work, it is time to try a more expensive drug like amphotericin B. If I'm right in my diagnosis, you may wish to reconsider giving away your book. (laughs) By writing such a clear and compendious tome, you may have given away secrets of parasitology to the entire world. Right, right. What a mistake that would be. (laughs) This may negatively affect your future employment prospects. Now that any schmo such as myself can do some of your job. (laughs) However, employment is always available in the burgeoning field of statistical software. Contact me if you need a job. We offer training to people with doctorates in other fields. (laughs) Right. Parasitically yours, Carl. (laughs) I think, Dixon, you and I don't have to worry about future employment. I'm not employed. You're not employed. I'm near the end of my Actually, I'm an adjunct at at Fordham, so I can't say that I'm not Daniel's a doc. He'll always be employed. Yeah, he'll always be employed. That's right. No, but this, if, form, if form. Carl is correct, I mean, this is pretty impressive, right? Isn't this what we Very set out impressive. to do? Yes, yes despite but, but the what humor. What Carl f- fails to recognize is that the vast majority of the world will not read your book. That's true. Are the you, vast you, majority. You, even if it's free. Yeah, of course. That's incredible. There's a ton of free stuff out there. Maybe we should pay them to read it. <laughs> well, then, then you might get it. <laughs> that would that's be a That's the plan. next step, yes. Why not? How you know, you, with every free book, you get How will $10. they prove it? How will they prove that they have read it? Well, that's the problem. That's that's true. That's uh, The proof is not easy to come by. So many people do not read. And of course, our listeners are an exception. Well, the problem but, is that the people that we're trying to help the most can't read for the most part. And as Daniel uh, will undoubtedly agree just reading a book does not make you a doctor no it does not so we're not worried even know what knowing what to do in this case doesn't make you the doctor daniel can you take the next one please yes peter writes dear twip team after a few after a very busy few weeks i have at last had time to catch up with the microbe tv podcasts I am currently residing in Mersin on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, where it is very dry with mid-November daytime temperatures of 23 C, dropping to 12 C at night. To get back to the TWIP 120 case study, the prognosis really does not look good for this patient. Fungating lesions are often associated with advanced cancer. Wait a minute. Did I I put the wrong one in here? 20 is the wrong episode. That's the fungating anal lesion, right? Oh, yes. Sorry. Whoops. This was, we'll read this later. Whoops. I'm sorry, Peter. It's my fault. Go, but go to Yosef. Yosef. <laughs> this is good. We'll go to Yosef. Yosef. 
Dear TWIP team, my primary diagnosis for this case is mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, most likely from an infection with leishmania brasiliensis. The infection can be acquired from the bite of an infected sand fly where the promastigotes are released and infect nearby dendritic cells and macrophages. While the initial infection may show up as an ulcer of the area, some of the amastigotes find their way to mucous membranes and start another reaction there. While the cutaneous lesions may heal, leading to the hypopigmented scars of our patient, the mucocutaneous lesions do not, and a chronic ulcer would form. Diagnosis would be by PCR. Treatment would differ depending on where she was. Most countries would use sodium stiboglucanate due to its availability and low cost. Amphotericin could be used if sodium stiboglucanate fails. I hope that this wasn't an arsenic-resistant strain. Mm. Alternatively, maybe you could call a lab and get some kinetoplastid proteasome inhibitor mentioned in TWIP-116 <laughs> for an experiment try if nothing else works. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff, Hofstra School of Medicine, class of 2018. P.S. Yes, we have a parasite lecture at the school. No, plural. <laughs> Any lecture. Just A. <laughs> I would love more, but I understand that there are a lot of other topics that need to be covered as well. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, Yosef, I mean, to give you a little bit of good news is part of our project is to give hard copy versions of our textbook to every medical student in the United States. And right. if I'm not mistaken, his school, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, is the first school where a donor has gone ahead and they're going to be receiving 400 copies they of will. our book. We're thrilled to We're be able thrilled. to do that So, too. Yosef, you're, you feel like Santa Claus. You're at, a, you're at a good place there. Absolutely. So I'll read the next two because the first one is well, well, What makes you think you can read two? <laughs> <laughs> Start with I'll, one. We'll see I'm how gonna it goes. Try, I'm going to really give it my best shot here. <laughs> Wink writes, <clears throat> I am hoping sincerely that Daniel saved the lady from Cusco from the likes of figure 4.2 of the sixth edition. But my guess is mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, wink, Weinberg. And the answer is um, forthcoming, and I'm sure that Daniel, with a smile on his face, gave away the punchline, but I won't spoil it for him. Shelby writes, greetings from Nashville. Tonight, it's a very welcome rainy 16 degrees C. That means that they've had a drought there for a while. My guess this week is mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. A simple test was mentioned, and I found that leishmaniasis could be diagnosed by taking a tissue sample and examining it for amastigotes of leishmania species, which is correct. And you could also culture it, too, if you'd like. MPU writes, Dear Tri Trippers, I've been to Peru and visited the Leishmania Clinical Unit at UPCH in Lima. And I worked on Leishmania Don and also Leishmania Brasiliensis and Leishmania Per. What's Per? Peruviensis. Peruviensis. Parasite genomes. And I've been listening since 2009. Nice. Diagnostic. MCL metastatic mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis or mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis. Parasite L. Brasiliensis. Diagnostic method, use lateral flow immunochromatographic strip. Treatment amphoterosin B. That was what a doctor told me at a clinic <laughs> for CL. Heat treatment of a few minutes. I, un I enjoy TWIP most among other Twixes. You have TWIPed a few papers from our institute on TRIP. You said, quote, we probably are mispronouncing names, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> also, the sleeping sickness diagnostic tool mentioned came from us. I am a nice. theoretical physicist, ended up in computational biology. Oh, Best MPU, Antwerp, Belgium. Marvelous. That's great. Dan yeah. writes. Here's one for Daniel from Dan. <laughs> from Dan. That's right. <laughs> Dear TWIP professors, both TWIP and TWIV have been unmissable since I discovered them six months ago. I'm working through the back catalog. I am a UK-based travel doc with more than a passing interest in parasites. Nice. Today, it's a windy six degrees C in London. For the 55-year-old Peruvian lady from the highlands around Cusco, the word mucocutaneous in Dr. Griffin's description was a big clue. Or was it a red herring? Ah. I'd still go for mucocutaneous leishmaniasis or a spundia as first choice. It could be a complication of um, leishmania. Are you going to pronounce the V for me so I don't do that wrong? Viana. Viana brasiliensis. Q 
subcutaneous leishmaniasis. We'll talk about what the V stands for, maybe if this is right. <laughs> um, endemic in parts of South America. This parasite is transmitted from animal hosts by phlebotomine sand flies. Right. It can be detected by PCR or possibly microscopy and culture. MCL, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, can cause major tissue destruction and usually needs systemic treatment with pentavalent antimonials or amphotericin. There's not a clear history of cutaneous leishmaniasis, although the hypopigmented scars on exposed extremities could be long healed previous lesions. For a non-parasitic differential, I'd consider Wegener's granulomatosis. Hmm. I think we call that something different um, because Wegener was a Nazi, I believe. Mm. Um, so, okay. mm. or malignancy. Looking forward to hearing the right answer. Keep up the good work. All right. Do you want to you check in that what the proper I name am. we should now call it's, that? It's now called granulomatosis granulomatosis with polyangitis. Yes. Previously so. known as Wegener's. Yeah. GPA. Yeah. No so there's been a few of these things we've renamed, and some people grow. Oh, we're renaming. It's like I think that you know, it's actually I'm in favor. Yeah. of renaming things when Absolutely. they have um, such Wedgener a history. himself was a malignancy. Yes. So David writes, Dear Twippers, I believe the woman from Peru has contracted a case of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, which occurs frequently in South American countries such as Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru. The culprit organism is most likely Leishmania brasiliensis or Leishmania donovani. The organism is spread by the bite of a female phlebotomine sandfly during a blood meal and metacyclic Metacyclic tripomastigotes are transferred into the bloodstream. Tripomastigotes? I'm sorry. Did I say tripomastigotes? I'm, I meant to say promastigotes. Wouldn't be tripomastigotes. No, you're absolutely that's right. That's trypanosomes, Thank right? Thank you. And it, I just and want it, to make sure. And it wouldn't have been Lishmania Donovani, but you should have picked up on that too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm giving you the peace sign. <laughs> Half of a peace sign. Thank you very much. Uh, these invade host macrophages or granulocytes transform into amastigotes and multiply within the infected leukocyte before escaping into the bloodstream to be taken up by the next blood meal. Invasion of this parasite can form a disfiguring lesion in the mucosal regions of the face called a chicleros ulcer. These can lead to social ostracization. Quite un. Fortunate for those who suffer. Once more, thank you very much for the informative podcasts. Sincerely, we talk David. a little bit about this. Yeah, I'd there like were to, few, um, yeah, there were a few. Sorry. There may be some confusions in this. Why response. is Donovani wrong, Dixon? Uh, sorry? Why would Donovani be wrong? Because it doesn't cause uh, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. It okay. causes it's a, it's a visceral. visceral. Yeah, causes good. visceral leishmaniasis. Got it. And uh, the, when the phlebotomine fly bites, it doesn't actually uh, introduce the promasticotes into the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. As, as the other email added, added correct, and perhaps um, we should recommend this individual download our free book so that he could uh, read yeah. the details of what's really good. Layla writes, hello to everyone. Oh, wait, and the Chiclero <coughs> ulcer, did you? No, I, I wanted to do address that too because that, that's obviously caused by uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, and not these tend the, to be on the ears. And Chiclero? Yeah, it, those are collectors of chickle. Uh, there's a group of people in South America and Central America that actually goes out early in the morning and collects the sap from a particular tree, huh. the chiclero tree, and that is what they make chiclets with. The gum. So why do they call it Chewing a gum. chiclero ulcer? Because it, the chicleros are the nickname that they give to the people who go out, and the, it's, it occurs on their ears a lot because they're out early, and that's when the sand flies are out. I love it. <laughs> Layla writes, hello to everyone. I was somewhat slow to finish the last episode, but since I don't believe a new case has come out, <laughs> I thought I would write in with my guest for TWIP 121. I think this woman has cutaneous leishmaniasis. The lesion in her nose may be a mucocutaneous development from an original untreated lesion. I'm a little hesitant in my guess because it seems like this is a relatively well-known endemic disease, and so I'm surprised she wasn't able to get a diagnosis earlier or closer to home. I look forward to your next episode. Mm-hmm. Right. Damn. Emily writes, greetings, esteemed doctors. I am writing to venture a guess as to the cause of the chronic epistaxis suffered by the woman in episode 121. I began listening to your podcast a little over a year ago when it was recommended to me during an undergraduate parasitology course taught by Dr. Stephen Nadler at UC Davis. Right. I have since completed my BS 
and I'm enjoying my first year of veterinary school at the same fine institution. I suspect that the Peruvian woman is suffering from cutaneous leishmaniasis. Both cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis are seen in Peru, but I believe the cutaneous form is found near Cusco. Also consistent with the diagnosis is the presence of dogs and rodents in her vicinity, as they can serve as a reservoir host for the protozoan. While the majority of her lesions resemble healed cutaneous ulcers, it is possible she is infected with a species also capable of producing mucocutaneous lesions. This would explain the scarring and concurrent non-healing nasal lesion. Thank you for the fantastic podcasts. I look forward to hearing the diagnosis. Best, <laughs> Emily. P.S. Perhaps I'm biased, but I would be interested to hear more <laughs> veterinary cases. Indeed. <laughs> well, Daniel's not going to give you them because he doesn't treat animals of that sort, right? No. But if there is a vet out there that would like to contribute a case, we'd love to like uh, your entertain colleague such a... Paul Cowley did. Yeah, we could have uh, another guest. We're happy uh, to have could, a guest. The requirement could. is. You have to sound good. Yeah, reach reach out reach out to us. <laughs> reach out to us, and if you have a case, we'd be happy to bring you on to describe it, right? And bring you back to uh, solve it, right? All right, Daniel. Oh, we we need to give the answer now, don't we? Yeah. I, no, we I, could. I, you're I wrong. Almost, I almost feel like <laughs> we could keep it was them given. for. We could keep them for another week or two. That's right. Now for the big reveal. No, the, the big reveal, as I mentioned, was a very simple test, and um, there there are several tests that might have helped with this diagnosis. But in this case, the woman had a PCR um, from scrapings at the edge of the ulcer. Hmm. And these were positive for, Dixon, do you have a guess? Leishmania brasiliensis. Yes, yes. They That's were not a guess. Wow. Um, and the, the giveaway <laughs> word was mucocutaneous <laughs> lesion, by the way. Now, and uh, the nice thing about the PCR is you, you get the, the subspeciation. You, know, you get to know which type of leash, leishmania. And that's important because as people will read in our textbook, because I, I actually think everybody's going to read the book. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Who wouldn't read a free book? <laughs> is not all of the leishmania species can cause this mucocutaneous lesion. Oh, and, and hopefully I mentioned mucocutaneous enough in my presentation <laughs> you did, you did, last did. <laughs> time to sort of steer people correctly. Right. Um, a lot of them will cause these cutaneous lesions. Right. Mm. Certain, such as Donovani, which we see over in, what do they call it, the old world, yes. um, uh, will cause a visceral leishmaniasis. But right. the um, Brasiliensis um, can cause this later metastatic mucocutaneous disease that we're seeing. Right. Um, so, yes, we, um, I think we had a lot of folks um, figure this out. We did. And as I think we were saying um, from the, the first gentleman that wrote in, this is our hope. This is our hope that right, people right. can listen, they can get the education, and that um, they can know what this is. Now, I wanted to address, there was one person who said, you know, this is pretty common. Um, someone should have picked it up in the Highlands. I think the issue in the Highlands is lacking, you know, a PCR, lacking the diagnostic tests, and that is a huge challenge. And second is the fact that this, you know, didn't get better. I'm sure people tried stuff up in the Highlands. Yeah. And that was that was the challenge, is getting her to a place where they had, um, you know, other options. And you also gather from the case history that this thing smolders for years. You think the other lesion she has is a result of that? Sure. Yeah. That's probably, you know, some of those hypopigmented mm -hmm. areas may very well have been scars. But, yeah. um, I mean, I think we're going to suspect at least one of them was a primary ulcer That's from... Right. Um, from so, the site of entry. So that was the original infection. So what's happened in all these years? Exactly. What has it's happened? happened. It's, Tell it's, us biologically. It has a very slow uh, rate of, of replication inside mm -hmm. these macrophages that it infects the mm -hmm. dendritic cells. And, and it is a yin and yang situation. I want to kill you. No, I want to infect you. No, I want to kill you. You, you get all these uh, cytokines produced, which uh, inhibits the rapidity of the growth, but it doesn't inhibit the growth. And so eventually this organism overcomes all of that, and eventually then it does start to replicate very fast, and that's when you get the uh, erosion of the soft palate. An, an interesting issue here, uh, you know, it, it all comes back to leprosy, right? I don't, I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but in my mind is when you try to see the organisms in one of these mucocutaneous lesions, mm. um, it's, tough, it's tough to find them. When you look at um, like a nice cutaneous lesion, you, you can even do these touch preps at the periphery and you, you right. can immediately stay and make the diagnosis. But a lot of what's going on in these mucocutaneous areas is an exuberant exuberant mm -hmm. immune response. Yes. And so they're posse organismal. 
Right. There are not a lot of organisms there, but right. this massive, which is why PCR is really kind of the ideal modality to use when you're yeah, looking yeah. at a mucocutaneous <laughs> lesion. Yep. Why does the why do the organisms go to the soft palate and nowhere else? That's a great question. I mean, nobody knows the answer, but uh, it doesn't go anywhere else. Oh right? no, it does. It goes to the other mucocutaneous junction, so I could go to the urogenital tract. Okay. To, to the anus, for instance, yeah, yeah, in women, yeah. it could go to the and it couldn't go in the mouth as well? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's what a spondia, remember that okay. uh, yeah. that big erosional lesion oh, yeah, of that right. gentleman? That's what that equals. So Yeah, you'll often see holes in the palate. What's remarkable is through. that these are treatable, and these people almost return to normal after the treatment. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a tremendous recovery for, for, for good treatments. How did you treat the woman? Um, in this case, actually, she ended up eventually getting um, amphotericin. Um, mm. The initially sodium stibagluconate, as people suggested, was tried, and and she relapsed, and later actually ended up to be treated. And that, that's unfortunately, um, we we often control, but I don't know if we ever completely clear the organisms with the current treatments we have. So even amphotericin will not clear it completely? I'm not sure you get sterilizing cure right. as much as control. So she may have a relapse in the future. That's, yeah, mm-hmm. a few percent of people will yeah. keep getting these relapses. Every and that so drug has uh, got some side effects that are pretty serious, as I understand. Yeah, amphotericin um, B, the, the standard form, has quite um, mm-hmm. a bunch of side effects. The liposomal form, though better tolerated, is very pricey. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a challenge. <clears throat> Indeed. Well, after you're done giving away the book, you ought to give away amphotericin B. <laughs> you know, there are... Wait, Liposomal you're, form. You're, you're Liposomal. laughing, but there are, there are companies out there that repurpose drugs that have double uses, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, they they target these kinds of drugs for uh, for uh, humanitarian purposes to give them away in certain circumstances, especially when there are major outbreaks of this. And uh, like in uh, India, for instance, there are major outbreaks of uh, Lishmania Donovani, mm-hmm. and this drug is extremely important for that. All right. Anything else, uh, Daniel, before we move on? I think someone brought up the issue that I think we discussed in a prior episode. In certain parts of the world, particularly um, in India, there's a lot of resistance to the, mm-hmm. to the antimonial uh, right. medications. It had a longer use history, I think, as well. Yeah, and then there was that, maybe it has something to do with the groundwater and the arsenic. Remember we talked yes. about that? I, I don't know, but yeah, um, yeah that's, a, that's a challenge, right? When you start losing your sure. frontline, inexpensive uh, medications. So another question I would have, too, is that when this woman goes back to her occupation of being a farmer mm-hmm. near Cusco, and she gets bitten again by an infected uh, Lutzemaya. In this mm, case, is, yeah. is there immunity or isn't there? Yeah. That's, the, that's the challenge, right? There, I mean, if what we're seeing is an exuberant immune response. Did you say you... that's the challenge? I th- I th- <laughs> did I say really? that? You said, did, that's did I say the that's the challenge? I'm sorry, that was a pun, but that, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> is the <laughs> second the infection challenge. a good challenge or not? <laughs> yes, so that's the second challenge now. And uh, so as we're seeing this exuberant, exuberant immune response, so when she gets um, bitten again, can they establish another cutaneous lesion? Yeah. Um, I don't think so, but I don't, because um, you don't so. see them. You don't end up seeing them. So I would say in general, but then when you do get a small amount of organisms to one of these mucocutaneous um, areas, there's something that triggers this um, you know, destruction. I right? would think it's a tough question because if you can never clear your first infection. How would you know if you had a second one or the same one? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, what potentially if the person was from an area where there's Brazilians, right? And a lot of these right. are in a mm-hmm. regional. And now they're in a new area where there's a, there isn't a form that causes mucocutaneous. But again, that's going to be saying, you know, do you get cross protection, right? Um, or, you know, so these sophisticated molecular technologies, can you PCR the one that's in the nasal lesion, PCR the cutaneous lesion and then look, you know, see if there's any differences in the sequence. Right. I mean, does it change over time too? That's the other question. Because this, I mean, this actually, you you segued right into a great topic, um, Mm -hmm. the scarification approach that's used in the Middle East. Um, In, um, as you know, as we've talked about, maybe, or if people look at our book, you can end up with some horrible scarring lesions from leech mania. So in certain parts of the world, what they do is they take a lesion, they do mm-hmm. a scraping at the edge, and then they inoculate a young child, hmm. usually in um, the buttocks area, some area that's hidden, yeah. so that they'll get the infection, the scarring there. And then that later does prevent them, protect hmm. them from a future infection, which might be on, let's say, the face, which can be disfiguring. 
But it's only good for that species. And that's, yeah, that's... That's the trouble with it. There is no cross-species uh, protection, unfortunately. Dixon, is there any importation of uh, people with Leishmania into the U.S.? They they actually imported um, a version of the Mediterranean um, mm-hmm. form of Leishmania into Kentucky, of all places, through hunting dogs. Dogs, yeah, yeah. So that's now endemic throughout the middle... Atlantic states, basically, and uh, is there octochthonous? There is, there is. We've got sandflies. It's just that we didn't have the parasites, and now we've got now we parasites do. too. And they're coming our way. They're coming our way, but I don't really, hmm. I don't recall ever hearing about a human case acquired in any of those states, like Tennessee or Kentucky or West hmm. Virginia. But uh, that's where the hunting dogs actually have spread this infection. Unfortunately, so you said this is more likely to be acquired in the morning. Well, the sand flies are more active in morning. early morning and in the evening. So uh, we had a, a, hmm. a very um, competent uh, leash, leash maniac, as we used to call them, working <laughs> in our lab. Her name was Suzanne Holmes Giannini, and she was the one that knew a lot about the um, the biting habits of these Lutzamaya flies. And, hmm. and, uh, and you could actually avoid infection altogether if you just went out after 10 o'clock and came home before, let's say, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And there are some occupations that allow that, but the Chicleros, whoever gets there first gets the sap, and everybody else has to mm-hmm. go second, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's earlier and earlier and earlier, and that's how they come to acquire this. Too bad. And by the way, um, we have a, a military training, uh, sort of a jungle training exercise mm-hmm. for, for the elite groups of our military, and they train in Panama. So this is a real uh, concern for those people when they go down there. And uh, treating and making sure they don't have any more uh, is essential if they're ever going to give blood, right? So we had a similar operation in uh, Operation Desert Storm Mm -hmm. where a lot of people acquired uh, Leishmania Tropica. Right. And uh, as a result, they were forbidden to give blood after that. That that, that equals some 600,000 people. Yeah, I remember. That's a big loss for the Army. Considering wounded. So many of those people came back to the U.S. and they're still infected. That's correct. That is right. Hmm. Yeah, And that's the problem. I mean, you'd love to wipe it out completely, even this low level, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. and to prevent transmission through the blood supply. Have you ever seen a case here in the U.S.? Not that was acquired in the U.S. But, but imported. Oh, lots of lots important of cases. Okay. Yeah. It's um, the the big thing now is people go to Costa Rica, right? And they go mm-hmm. on these river rafting right. trips yeah. and the sand flies are on the bank. So, you know, they... They take a little bit of a break, and next thing you know, they've got an ulcer, and it will not heal. And I've actually seen several. I think we we actually talked about a, um Italian man um, yeah. who um, came here um, originally from Italy. Hmm. Um, i got to be careful. I, if I haven't discussed him yet, I'm describing <laughs> too much detail. Exactly. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> My lab used to be right next door to the dermatology clinic, and uh, the people that they saw with these lesions had returned from the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were oil executives. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> being treated at the highest levels yeah. by all these Arab princes, and and then they come back with these lesions that won't heal, and they, what the heck is that? And mm. in the old days, we used to have to culture them using uh, Schneider's medium, which is an insect culture, tissue culture medium. Yeah. Today, the yep. PCR will take care. I know Schneider. You do, really? Yeah, I know nice. Schneider medium. All right, thank you, you two fine gentlemen. Thank you very much. Are we done? For kind of fine. Go <laughs> Are you, you can't leave yet. No, we have more to no, do. No, no. But that's the first segment. Exactly. I want to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content, founded by John Hendricks, who used to be with Discovery Channel. And that means you're going to get real science shows. You can view the content of Curiosity Stream on the web, right in your web browser, or on your TV. And Dixon may be saying, how could I watch the internet on my TV? How can I? Well, Dixon, there are these little (laughs) doohickeys. The doohickey. Small boxes. Oh, the doohickey. You plug one end into the internet and the other into your TV. Oh, and it works. Amazing. Which part of the TV do I plug it into? USB port? There's no USB usually. It's just an HDMI port. Okay, on your it's a, TV. It's a single. So you know what HDMI is? No well, idea. we'll talk about it later. <laughs> that way you can get this content. And these include Apple TV, Roku, Roku, which is a Japanese word for number six. Roku. Ichi ni sonshi, 
go Roku oh, number see, six goes to Japan for three weeks. It comes back. My son expert, is a, <laughs> my son is minoring in Japanese. He's college. fluid in Japanese. <laughs> he drinks a lot of sake. I can't count sorry. beyond six. Sorry, <laughs> go Roku. <laughs> I forgot the. My son has tried to teach me huh. Android, uh, iOS, Chromecast, etc. One hundred ninety six countries. What they have is science, technology, nature, history, fishing. Right, fishing. I heard. I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> Documentaries, interviews, yeah. lectures. Yeah. Maybe they'll have your lecture one day. Could be. Could be. You know, you should share it with Curiosity Stream. Well, uh, maybe some of my TED talks are on there. Who knows? Some of the interesting pieces they have. A brand new one by Stephen Hawking called "His Favorite Places." He gets in a spaceship. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Which yes. is a, a computer-generated spaceship. Very interesting. Thing. And he says, "We're going to stop at my favorite places, and right, one of which is Saturn." Right. What would your favorite place in the universe be? I'd so? like. I would love to see what it looks like on the surface of Io. Io. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Daniel? You know, I'd love to go to the star nursery that's in Orion's oh, belt and that. see like the stars. Oh, that's cool. But I want it somehow sped up so I can. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, well, by the time you get there, they'll just, be adults. I'm just not that patient. <laughs> I want to go to the edge of the universe. There is no edge. Ah, uh-huh. I guess I would never find There's it. No right? Edge, no it just keeps no. going and going. It goes around. How is that possible? Well, it could be a Mobius strip. Yes, you keep coming back to where you yeah, start. That's right, exactly. Well, I'd like to experience that. <laughs> okay. Or how about being driven through a black hole? As long as you could come out the other side. Actually, I'd like to be at the center of the sun. The center of the sun. That would be high pressure, wouldn't it? And hot. (laughs) We'll go go at night. (laughs) (laughs) You know what the center of the sun actually contains is metallic hydrogen. Metallic hydrogen, not just hydrogen. Metallic. It's under such pressure that that's what it is. Yeah. They also have a series called Digits by Derek Mueller, who is the creator of a YouTube science channel called Veritasium. Uh-huh. Somehow that has the, the name truth in it, right? Veritasium. In vino veritasium. In vino veritasium. <laughs> and this explores online safety and security, how not uh-huh. to get hacked. And they have interviews with people like Edward Snowden, the supreme hacker, I guess, or maybe not. He just took things. And uh, Vint Cerf. Co-founder of the internet, <laughs> Deep Time History, the 14 billion year history of the universe, and Underwater Wonders of the National Parks that brings nice. you beneath the bodies of water. This is the 100th year anniversary of the National Parks. Jackson, do you like the National Parks? I love them. I've been to a lot of Do you think they should be exploited for mining purposes? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't want to go there. That's being suggested sorry. now. Sorry. The Native American res- reservations are now under attack for that very uh, reason. But no, I'm not. A, I'm not in favor of that at all. Curiosity Stream also has super high definition video, 4K over 50 hours. Now, how do you get this? That's the real question because you're dying to know. They have monthly and annual plans available, starting at two dollars and ninety nine cents a month, less than a cup of coffee or a single title on some of the competing platforms. Check out CuriosityStream.com/microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That is two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIP. We're very grateful, aren't we, gentlemen? Indeed. Yes. Now, we have a paper today which we was did. selected by the eminent... Yes. Dixon de Pommier. Yes. Well. And I do call you eminent. Imminent. <laughs> What's imminent about you? It means <laughs> I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. It was I'm about published to on November 1st in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, of which at this table there are no members. That's true. <laughs> Not, neither, neither of the three of us. Couple of wannabes. <laughs> and it is called Community Deworming Alleviates Geohelminth-Induced Immune Hypo-Responsiveness deworming it just brings up images dixon which are unspeakable correct but it's not that bad you just give people drugs and the worms come popping out right dixon well boy this is a long long list of authors i'm going to just read the first author who is right. linda wamis and the last author is maria yazdan baksh they are from leiden medical center in the netherlands there's at leiden dixon leiden Light. department of microbiology at um Hassan Nudin University in Indonesia. And then we have uh, the Netherlands, Laboratory for Medical Immunology and Microbiology, St. Elizabeth Ziekenhuis. There you go. 
and another Leiden or Leiden. And then we have University of Leeds and um, Radboud University Nimjin Medical Center, which is in the Netherlands. That's Nijmegen. Nijmegen? Yeah, Nijmegen. What did I say, Nijmegen? You said something like Nijmegen. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's you did. <laughs> I think we're mispronouncing some of the no, words. We'll get letters. We'll get letters. That's fine. <laughs> that that one letter was funny. <laughs> I guess he was agreeing that we were mispronouncing. So this is all about soil transmitted helminths, which they say is the most common infectious disease worldwide. I actually right. didn't know that. Did you, Daniel? I didn't know. The mo- really? Even more than toxoplasma? Well, it's the soil transmitted. It's the most. Your group in a bunch. That's that's why they win. I get it. Yeah. A bunch of different. So, what are the different soil transmitted helminths, Dixon? Well, we've got hookworms. Hooksworm. We've hooksworm. got ascaris. ascaris. We've got trichuris. Trichuris. We've got strangeloides. Wow. So you got four different groups. Four different groups. Yep. Four, it's technically four different genera, right? This is right. Let's be scientifically genera. precise. Genera. genera. And they're affectionately or ineffectually referred to as the. Well, the unholy trinity and strongle ladies. The three, <laughs> no, no, no. Very good. No. three of them were referred to as the unholy trinity. This is true. Ascaris, hookworm, and trichuris, because they're often found together. All right. The issue here in which they're looking at is that these infections suppress the immune response. That's we have right. talked about this countless times on TWIP, yeah, right, have, Dixon? We have. From the very beginning. We have. And this, of course, for the parasite is good so that they can stick around. So what does it mean for the host, right? But the host gets kind of Tell me about a it. problem. And, and because this is a childhood infection, right? That's eh. important to keep in mind. So you can so, get other infections. Or, as we're going to reveal throughout this context, um, children are obviously available for um, immunizations. Yeah, you want to vaccinate kids, and this can interfere with it, immune responses and in to fact, vaccines, that's right? what the implication is from this uh, article, is that how can we hope to wipe out all these other infections when we have good measures for doing it when these ever-present infections are preventing them from responding fully? The interesting thing there, Dixon, is that we have come close to eradicating polio by vaccination. It's only you're present in three right. countries, despite right. the worms being present in a lot of the you other countries. Right. So you are right. if you try hard enough, although there are, you know, India was a big problem with polio vaccination for years, and it may have been because of worms it's interfering possible. with vaccine responses. We were talking before the show, that would be an interesting study to do. We give vaccine to two groups with a pretreatment with albendazole, mm-hmm. right, to get rid of worms. And without, see if you get a better take. But you can't do that study because you already know that the worms will interfere with it, so you have to do the right thing to begin with. I don't know if we really do. Well, think? That's no, why like we some do things do we study, think yeah. we know, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and I think what's nice about this investigation here is they're starting to really get at a molecular level, what are the helminths sure. doing? Um, yeah. You know, what cells are they affecting? What that's cytokine right. levels are that's changing? Right. Um, and they've picked... An organism that these people can also encounter naturally, and that is uh, falciparum malaria. So mm-hmm. do, do these helminths affect the way you respond to an infection with malaria? Got it. Now, listeners may be wondering what the mechanism of immunosuppression is. Ah, uh, yeah. Which is what these guys And these are interesting. These are about. also <laughs> interesting. And they get a little information, but we, we really don't know. Um, it's multi-system. You know, it, it seems to involve a certain type of, CD4 T cell, um, but we'll see. We're going to get some data, right? So this is a large field study. Yes, um, it is a they, large. <laughs> I mean, really large. They had uh, they did a household cluster randomized, right? Double blind, right? Placebo controlled trial of albendazole once every three months, right? In communities in the Flores Island of Indonesia that have a high prevalence of soil transmitted helminths. By the way, what what also is very interesting about that <laughs> island? I have no idea. Is that where Krakatoa is? No, there was another species of hominid living there. Hominid? Florensis. Uh, Homo florensis? Yeah, the, the little one. Really? The little... Yeah. Not Homo, though. It was something yeah. else. It was... What uh, was the uh, genus? Oh, we could look that up right now, I bet. Yeah. I don't okay. remember the genus, but uh, they they said on that island they found the bones of a very small really? hominid, which is related to Homo erectus, which left Africa yeah. early. So that's an interesting island from many perspectives. 954 households. On the, the island? No, that's how many were involved in this study with 1,059 yeah, subjects. A lot of all households. ages. Mm-hmm. And 88% of them had one or more helmets. <laughs> well, look at that. I mean, I mean that's... They, so they, 
They enrolled them and there's, then they checked. There's a lot of helmets. There's a lot of worms. And now, if you did that study here in New York City, what would you find? Nothing. Zero? Yeah, because these are soil transmitted. I think Daniel would disagree. I wouldn't, you wouldn't get zero, but you would, you know, it'd be it a It depends on your low. patient population. Well, so he says in New York City, and as we know, 30% of the people in New York City, they were not born here. They're not from here. And they don't just no, stay, right. and they don't just stay here. So you would, you know, the certain percent would have no, no, um, soil true. transmitted health. That's true. So the most prevalent, But not 89.7%. percent acquired. Not a total. I would agree with that. So the most common was hookworm, 77% of the total. Hookworm. So they took these people, they gave them albendazole, right? Well, we, can we pause just a moment? You can. So <laughs> what does this suggest in terms of the sanitary conditions under which they're living? They have poor sanitation. They have no sanitation. They don't have poor sanitation. So they there's no none. toilets. No toilets. There's nothing to sit on. You just the go outdoor, outside. The outdoors is the And toilet. you urinate or defecate. Both. And hopefully you go far from your home. Eh. Little kids? <laughs> they do it right in the street. They don't care. No, have, no six, no six foot deep pit toilets, right? Uh, yeah, none, because otherwise the kids would fall into them. So this is random defecation in the environment, in a tropical environment, which allows the survival of these hmm. parasites for a long time. But hookworm, remember that you have to be penetrated by the worm after it hatches in the stool, right? So that means, and they have a short lifespan of maybe two weeks at most. Mm-hmm. But it's continuous transmission time. except yeah. during the dry seasons. Mm-hmm. which is amazing, absolutely amazing to realize that in this day and age, people would say that don't know any better, they would say in this day and age, this couldn't possibly happen. And yet it's perfectly normal for this region. In other regions as well, right? I yes, mean, plenty of other regions as well. And this That's used great. to happen in the south of the U.S., right? That's exactly, and it's still happening in some places in the border of Tennessee and Kentucky. There is there is some uh, soil transmitted just uh, uh, strongyloides and hookworm there. So a well. good thing to do for the gates foundation would be to install six foot deep latrines in these places right yeah that are protected i mean that you could sit on a platform to defecate into because otherwise if it's just a hole that's very dangerous well, for kids I, I don't think you could just dig a hole in the ground and say go no but that used to be the case you sometimes. have to put a shed around it yep. yeah and, and then a little moon you cut it in the door right <laughs> and and light. well no you don't want a door i don't know if i ever can i have an older <laughs> brother with some very interesting ideas and he had an outhouse in his yeah. home that was up at ten thousand feet in the mountains it had no door and I was like, Greg, why does your outhouse have no door? He goes, well, I don't want it to get blown over. I said, right. Well, what, it seems like it would be more likely to get blown over with the door off because you know, catch the wind. Mm. He's like, have you ever seen an outhouse without a door that was blown over? I said, well, well, <laughs> well no. That was a trick question. That's a trick <laughs> and question. And have you seen outhouses with doors that have been blown over? <laughs> well, yes. And Voila. Uh, there you go. And so that was his theory. And you know what? The outhouse uh-huh. never blew over. Without a door. Without a door. So he was right, but what an unpleasant, uh, you know, you'd visit the guy. And- <laughs> well, you could put a curtain, you could put a curtain, you could put a curtain in the front. Yeah, but right? then it might have blown over and it would be my fault because I put the curtain up. You know, I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> oh, this is much too complicated. <laughs> so they treated these uh, cohorts with albendazole. After nine months, the worms went from ni- 84 to 51%. After 21 months, 80 to 39%. Yeah. So that was the length of the Not trial. a complete eradication. Not even close. Nope. Yeah. But enough. Now, but why enough. is that? Is there, the drug is not effective, it's resistance, or combination of these Yeah, drugs? no, I think, you know, as you're acquiring something, like yeah. the egg of a worm, for instance, the drug would not touch the larva inside the egg, for instance. So if you had just swallowed some and then you took the drug, the drug yeah. dissipates rapidly. The egg takes a little while to hatch, and the next thing you know, you've got another level of infection mm-hmm. to deal with. So, or I guess we should probably mention the transmission. So the hookworm, right, is going to penetrate your skin. That's right. So the person is going to be walking barefoot. Yeah, and then it's going to yeah. be going through a cycle. And you know, you take one dose of albendazole. So they're using like 400 milligrams for adults and adjusted for kids. Yeah. That's not 100 nope. percent. Um, so that's the one factor. The second is going to be um, the reinfection. I mean, they're still living there. They're still walking they around are. at times barefoot. They're still getting reinfected. And um, third, which sort of goes back to the first one, is starting to see resistance to these drugs. Hmm. So when we look at efficacy rates, what we're now getting in a lot of parts of the world is not what we used to be because they do these massive drug campaigns, right? And so we're selecting for um, albendazole and mobendazole resistant yeah, um, soils transmitted helmets. They're using them again and again and again. And some of the others like Ascaris are going to actually... You know, not going to be through the skin. It's going to be, yeah. you know, you ate feces accidentally. That's right. Um, so, yeah. And the hookworm larvae can actually form a dower larva. 
It can actually rest inside muscle fibers for a long time. Mm, dour. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah, so that's senior uh, has a dower yeah. larva also. This has a dower stage. Uh, Jerry Shad actually showed that he worked at the University of Pennsylvania mm. and was a good friend of mine, and and he studied hookworm infection in Indy a lot, and he couldn't account for how does this worm survive the dry season, right? We drug them out, everybody's been treated, mm-hmm. and yet mm-hmm. before the rains come again, but just before these parasites appear in, in the gut tract. Yeah. So where are they coming from? And they, it turns out they were coming from these muscle fibers that were. Infected with larvae that were arrested in their development. Yeah. And they just sit and wait for the other parasites to go away and so they can continue their own life cycle. It's an insidious uh, adaptation that nature has given these parasites to survive, even in the face of very strong immunity. Yeah, that's a wild, yeah. I have to say, that's kind of a wild aspect of the hookworms. This it is. W- a worm that can go into a latency state. Exactly. Right? And then Can't later, touch me. I have no metabolism. Yeah, for months. <laughs> and then later come back out. Yeah. yeah it's frightening. Uh, so the other sad part of this story, I must tell you, this, mm-hmm. you read this and and their conclusion is very strong in favor of something which I won't go into, but it was a positive result that they got. But they can't continue to do this forever. No. So the, this whole village will go right back to where it yeah. was before. But in the sure. meantime, we will have found out that, yes, these parasites do knock down your immune response. Yes, you have a more serious bouts of plasmodium falciparum as the result. What's to be done? And, of course, the easiest but most expensive thing is to just make sure that you have good sanitation. No, I thought that was excellent, yeah. Vincent, that yeah. you brought that yeah. up. Like our natural thing is like, oh, let's you know, free drugs for everybody. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times, it's the infrastructure. It's dig a hole. That's the whole idea. That's yeah. what. Yeah. Made oh, this look, did, that, great. the whole idea. Did you see that? The whole idea. The whole six foot idea. We, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, true. that was on purpose. <laughs> so Vincent probably just stepped right into that, Mark. <laughs> stepped into it. So that sometimes a low tech approach. I mean, this I, is I, not so low tech though because it's not just a hole. It's got to be deep enough not to allow yeah, worms to crawl out. But it's lower tech than uh, giving everybody drugs that don't work <laughs> all the weird. time. They don't get you below a certain percentage. And right? notice they didn't give ivermectin, which if they had, it probably would have eliminated more of the worms, but it's a very expensive drug. Well, they could have gotten Merck to donate it like they did for river blindness. Maybe. Yeah. We just talked to Rory Vagelos, yeah, well. our colleague. Yeah. Well... During the course of this treatment, they took blood from these individuals. They did. And then they put them in culture and then added various antigens and asked, uh, what kinds of cytokines are made in response? They used like lipopolysaccharide, phytohemagglutinin, and, 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 and red blood cells with plasmodium falciparum in them, an ascaris antigen. Right. And they ask, they measure the cytokines that are produced. So first, PHA, phytohemagglutinin, <laughs> a classic... Uh, antigen used to stimulate immune responses. Is that from the keyhole limpet? No, that would be keyhole limpet antigen. Oh, okay. <laughs> KLA. Where did get the phytohemagglutinin from? <laughs> you want to know where PHA comes from? Yeah, yeah we I'm can find out. Curious. PHA faciolus vulgaris. PHA. Faciolus? Faciolus vulgaris. What is it? Faciolus, P-H-A-S-E-O-L-U-S. Vulgaris, the common bean. <laughs> It comes from a bean? <laughs> yes. Phytohemagglutin is from the bean. It's a lectin. Right. Right. And it, it stimulates cytokine responses. Okay. Now, what happens? Albendazole increases both TNF and IL-10 secretion. Right. When you add PHA. Right. Um, and um, did not affect responses to LPS. No. Also, interferon gamma responses to uninfected blood cells were not different between the two arms. Um, where's the malaria one? Does that come? Oh, I, I skipped it. Yeah, no. I skipped right. it. Plasmodial antigens. Plasmodium falciparum infected red blood cells. Yeah, yeah. An increase over time in TNF and gamma, interferon gamma after treatment. So this is to a plasmodium antigen over time. So you get rid of the worms, you increase uh, the cytokine response to plasmodial antigens and then the red blood cells without the plasmodium, there's no difference. Got it, Dixon? Of course I did. What about Ascaris? What about it? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Ascaris antigen result? So if you look at, I was looking at table one, does that? Yeah, yeah. table one is good. So down towards the bottom. Ascaris there antigen is at the last yeah. one. Yeah. So um, the placebo and albendazole, those are those two columns. Placebo, uh, uh, but not, not much of a difference, right? No. 
Yeah, I would have liked to see this um, table done with you know statistics thrown in just to sort of draw your eyes to the ones. Yeah, that, yeah that's right. They that's have right. ranges, but uh, yeah, I mean they put a lot of data in this one table. Um, they did, but just to try to get you know because I look at you know I see IL ten in a few of the different columns, and I see like you know going from seventy six to seventy or going from two seventy one to two fifty. I'm not just that's I'm not sure how much how significant these differences are, and right. and I think of IL ten as as not being a pro inflammatory. Cytokine, and we're almost seeing all cytokines dropping, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instead of like what I would would have liked to see is is a shifting, like from you know, let's say TH two to TH one or the other way, seeing seeing a shift, and it just seems like everything, um, you know, shifts a little bit. And they're not taking you know continuous samples; these are points yeah, these along are points. a very long curve, basically. So yeah, I mean, with the with the um, plasmodium, we we see our interferon gamma, right? Our TH one right. signature cytokine right. actually go up, right? One sixty three right. right. to one seventy six. So that's um, you know we treat albendazole, and that's sort of the idea. Oh, maybe the malaria is going to be more severe. Yeah. 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 Um, but then you know with the LPS, we go from seven forty three to seven sixty nine. Um, Right. Yeah. yeah, there's no difference in the LPS. So LPS doesn't, that would imply that any bacteria with LPS is not going to be a problem in these kids with worms. No. Yeah. But we're only looking at a couple of cytokines, so who knows, right? Yeah. That's all true. Yeah. So I would have liked to see a column with, you know, statistics yeah. so we know, you know, because, yeah, we've got a thousand people and, you know, get a sense, is this just sort of a little bit of a drift or are we really getting significant yeah. difference? There is one display of data, though, that I really loved later on in this paper that's mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. And I was unfamiliar with the uh, the spider diagram. Yeah, figure one. I loved it. It's very cool, isn't it? I loved it. It's really a great snapshot. Yeah, so you have like a pentagon with the TNF Five different readings. The, the five different cytokines. That's right. The normals are inside. And then as they... Uh, get bigger they, they yeah. move towards the, the label of whatever cytokine they're talking about and it's it's actually quite an amazing i mean uh, this is along the lines of what i was sort of asking yeah, about yeah, are you yeah, getting a, right. a shift you know so well, exactly. it's sort of the crude you know inflammatory anti-inflammatory but i think what we've tried to talk about is that there's certain styles of yeah. responding yeah you know and we have our interferon which we think of as like a th1 we have yeah. our il10 which you know we might put in a different maybe th um Two, maybe, yeah. um, our TNF alpha. Right. Um, so, you know, we're getting, they're, they're sort of putting them into the different um, types of immune responses. Exactly. You know, I'm not getting this. This TNF seems to be really pumped up, right? It is. But if you look at the table, I'm trying to find. So, uh, there, know, so the red is our, so here, <laughs> I guess our, our listeners can't see this, but we're looking now at figure one. And what there are is these pentagons. And the pentagons have at each corner, like sort of we'll say a, a signature cytokine of a particular type of response. So yeah. TNF-alpha at the top, interferon gamma at the right, IL-2 at the left, IL-5 at the bottom left, IL-10 at the bottom right. So you picture this pentagon. And then you look at, in different colors, the different stimuli. And and then, you know, where does that sort of shift? And so when they look at, um, in the figure A, the red, which is our... Um, Valciparum response, you see a, an increase in TNF alpha. That's right. Um, you know, and the other staying relatively the same. In Figure B, we're seeing this shift towards IL yeah. ten. You know what the problem is when you look at the table. You don't see a big difference because, in fact, that whole range of TNF is found also in the untreated people. It's just that when you treat, you probably get more people with a higher level of mm-hmm. TNF. But you know, if you look at TNF in response to say. Plasmodium, you know, the untreated you get between four and forty-two, and the treated three to thirty-eight. It looks like there's no effect, but yeah. I'm sure there are more people in the treated group that had a higher level, and you can't tell that from this table. Yeah, it's just giving you the range. That's where those pentagons. Is that what it is? A pentagon, right? Pent- pentagram. Yeah. <laughs> Spider Pent- diagram. That's where that gives you <laughs> the increase. Yeah. Yes. And then they have the Ouija board to the right now. That's right. <laughs> no, but I, I, I like the visualization of that data. Yeah. That's, that's a very clever way of... So they did a couple it. of controls. They ruled out that the drug itself was enhancing the immune response. They stratified the data uh, according to um, infection status at baseline. And yep. it's quite clear that yep. um, it's it's not a cause of uh, albendazole treatment. And also increases in cell counts did not explain changes in cytokine responses. Oh, no, that's right. Now, the last set of experiments are to find out what is happening that might give some mechanistic information. 
So they look at T cell populations. Right. They, lo- they look at T reg cells, which are defined by surface antigens, by flow cytometry. And they also look at CD4 positive T cells with the suppressive molecules PD-1 and CTLA-4. Mm-hmm. T regs, which are regulatory T cells, which you might, be, you might guess would be involved in immune suppression, these did not change in the albendazole group. And PD-1 expressing CD4 cells also uh, involved in, in immune re- control. They didn't change either. But CTLA-4 expressing CD4 cells decreased after albendazole treatment. So it could be that th- that cell group. D- Daniel, can you provide some insight into CTLA-4 expressing CD4 yeah, cells? Yeah, I guess, as, you know, as, as Vincent is going through this, so we, you know, so we had all our baseline stuff. We had our pentagrams, pentagrams. <laughs> Pentagon <laughs> diagrams, spider diagrams. Right. And then table two, we're looking at, you know, okay, now we've treated them for nine months or 21, and we're seeing, you know, what's going on in placebo, what's going on in albendazole. So these are sort of the treatment effects. And then we're getting our, now let's look not just at cytokines, but the cells. And so we have our T regulatory cells, and that's going to be, they're referring to CD25 Fox P3. So we're seeing a drop in our number of regulatory or what used to be called suppressor T cells before that went out of vogue and they came back with a new name. But what, so T cells, they're these regulatory cells and we'll say they produce, they do produce cytokines that calm down other um, T cells. Mm-hmm. Um, calm down is probably a, that makes sense. That modulate. makes sense. Like modulate. It. But what they also have is on their surface is molecules that can directly engage with other T cells, um, with cytotoxic T cells. And these would be, PD-1, program Corbin death ligand one, yep, yep, yep. and CTLA-4, which is cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4. And what both of those do is they'll actually, of the same name, but then with ligand or receptor thrown at the end, so this is the ligand and it's going to bind to the receptor. Yep. When they engage that receptor, they will calm down the cytotoxic T cells, prevent them from becoming activated. Right. And I th- you guys all remember President Carter, right? Absolutely. Who I actually think was an excellent president. I do too. In large part because he did not do a lot of harm, which actually happens yeah. when other people are presidents. Um, <laughs> but he, if you recall, had an ocular melanoma. Mm-hmm. And his immune system was failing to eradicate that melanoma because the melanoma had on its surface program death mm, ligand right. one which was calming down his ctla4 <laughs> and it was basically telling his his yeah. t-cells don't attack this tumor yeah. we're shutting them and when they gave him antibodies that block those two down regulating molecules what did his immune system do killed him it cured the cancer it did it's great immunotherapy it did, i mean so modulated it killed it yeah so you know amazing so the pd1 uh, t-cells didn't change with albendazole, but the CTLA-4 did, which would suggest that that particular calming mechanism may be involved in... Yeah, it seems like it's associated with the helminths, and you get rid of the helminths, and then you, you know, no longer... You can attack the malaria. You can attack whatever you want to... Or whatever you're being infected Or immunizations that result in uh, permanent immunity. Yeah, or any immunization that depends upon having a good, robust cytotoxic effect. That's right. Uh, Yep. That's basically it. There's, there's the result, and um, so what do we do? So they say here, three monthly treatments over two years did not eliminate worms. No. And what do they say to do for better deworming? More intensive treatment or inclusion of an environmental control would be needed. An In other words, an outhouse. <laughs> or some other sanitary yeah. approach. That's correct. But knowing uh, how difficult it is to live in the tropics to begin with, uh, both water and food are major stumbling blocks to uh, good health. The sanitation comes third. And so addressing those first two issues is the main uh, thrust of people living in extreme poverty. And, and these people are living in extreme poverty. So you can't argue with their priorities. Uh, and if you came in and said, we know how to help you, we'll install um, sanitary uh, toilets and, and things of this sort, uh, I've seen programs actually get diverted because it turns out that they're using human feces as a fertilizer. Yeah. 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 So this is a collection mechanism rather than a way to sequester it. And uh, so you have to have mm-hmm. another approach to mm-hmm. that situation because that relates to their food. So that, that all feeds sure. back to the same problem. 
An interesting comment. They end the paper talking about how um, alleviating this immune suppression might have a major public health impact in terms of vaccination. And, mm-hmm. But they say it's also important to consider the long-standing coexistence of humans and helmets. So if we disturb it, What's going to happen? Will new pathological conditions emerge? We'll That's have point. inflammatory bowel disease, yeah, exactly. maybe. Maybe we'll have rheumatoid arthritis. Maybe we'll have all these autoimmune diseases. Maybe our malaria, if we don't get rid of that, will be more severe. What is the, right? What did Bob Dylan say? If the lightning don't get you the thing, what did he say? The something <laughs> will? So you take away the infections, you get inflammation. Well, I mean, you can't yeah, win. Damned if you do. I have to look up that don't. saying. You don't know what it is, uh, Daniel, do you? If the You know, Bob lightning, Dylan's lyrics are so complicated and involved. It's a miracle he can If the thunder remember don't them. get you, the lightning will. That's right. Well, that's right. <laughs> Because you, does that, the thunder yeah. ever get you? <laughs> no, no, the thunder never gets it. But it's just a saying, you know. Yeah. No, right. I I think you could win. I mean, I'm an optimist, right? I think that there well, are you have to be. Yeah, there are parts of the world where there's clean oh, yeah. water, yeah. nutritious yeah. food, yeah. Yeah. sanitation. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, Dixon, as you bring up, it's important that we don't you know rush in with this sort of um, hubris or arrogance or. We know how to fix everything. Right. Us? And, hubris? Yes. <laughs> Humans? <laughs> when I was in India, right, I'm in these areas that are, you know, not not maybe the nicest parts of the world. And there was a big movement, and actually it's by the people in India, right? So it's, it, it's not always necessarily like what makes you arrogant is that you're from somewhere else. But mm. they say, you know, these people need toilets. They need, and so they had this massive yeah. program. They built, I don't know how many hundred thousand um, bathrooms, indoor attached bathrooms, and they're beautiful. They're built by the government, they're tile, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and now they're the nicest room in the house, and, and no one's going to defecate in there. That's the nicest room in the house. That's where you store your food. That's God where you put dear. all the good stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> all right, you can't make it so nice then. That's yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> I think it's, again, it's, you, you've got to work with people. You yeah, come yeah, up with what, what works, sure, you know? I've sure. got some knowledge, you've got some knowledge. How can we, you know, how can oh, we come up with a solution? That's right. There are too many examples of uh, wanting to do the right thing and ending up doing the wrong thing. Yeah. This is exactly right. All right, our next phase, Dixon. Yeah. We're going to ask Daniel for a new case study. What do you think? Outstanding. You might have one from... Regale Houston us. Trip. I've been really busy. No. <laughs> 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 I have a case. And this is going to... I'll actually sort of uh, let, our, let our listeners know that I'm going to do a series of cases in a row. And there's going to be a theme to these cases. And I think people will pretty much catch on quickly what the theme is. Um, All right. So here is the story of a 23-year-old female international aid worker with a chief complaint of diarrhea. And so this is, a, we'll say, a young, attractive woman of Dutch descent who's been in a rural area of the Dominican Republic, um, Western Western Dominican Republic, Close to the Haitian border. Seems like a hit on the um, <laughs> <laughs> the geography of where um, Dr. Griffin mm-hmm. just was. <laughs> and it's, it's an interesting story. And, and so I'm going to give you the whole story, and then you guys put it together. I'm no judgment from me on, on <laughs> you know, what are the important details. Um, and the story is that it's been raining, lots of rain. And the, and the rain is coming down, and, and a lot of the houses have these tin roofs. Some of them have these flat concrete roofs, but then they'll have areas um, where maybe a piece of PVC pipe is um, put and the rainwater pours off. So she's, so she's here at the office of the NGO for which she's working, and it's raining and the water's coming out through the tube. And a child comes by with mangoes for sale. You know, a bunch of mangoes. Would, would you want to buy a mango? And she's been here for nine months and she's very comfortable now. And um, so she's sure that would be great. So she buys a mango for some... Um, small amount, <laughs> and uh, the child sells her the mango, but now she's excited to eat the mango. So in general, what people are doing is taking the fruits and vegetables, and they soak them in like a bleach thing, they get them right, clean, right. And then they peel them, and she's been there for nine months, and here's here's running water coming <laughs> exactly, off the roof. Exactly Why right. not wash the mango right there? Come so on. She goes ahead, and she washes the mango right there. Mm-hmm. And now... She she needs to open it. She doesn't have a knife, but she has oh, she has teeth, right? She does have. So teeth. she bites open the mango, peels it, goes ahead and eats the mango. It's it, she's having a great time. 
Ah, now the that old night, skin, the old skin of the mango. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, there, there certainly is. Um, the old drain on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and that night, she's she's not feeling that well. She's feeling same like... Night, the same night. night. That, that night, she's... That quick. She's not feeling that well. That's pretty quick. So that night, she's not feeling what that well. What does she have? Diarrhea? Um, she knows she's starting to have some loose stools. Loose stools. Yeah, I'm not saying that anything's connected. I'm just does telling the story, right? Dis- <laughs> abdominal, <laughs> abdominal discomfort here. She's starting to have a little bit of abdominal discomfort, a little bit of loose stools. Oh, interesting. And the next day, she goes with her group um, up to, um, I think, the border town I mentioned, Dahabon, which is a border town between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And when she gets there, she's got full-fledged diarrhea. And you know she's used to having diarrhea, but this she feels is a lot of diarrhea. It's more than her diarrhea that she's used to. Mm. But you know she's she's been there nine months. It's all good. But she looks into the toilet, mm. and this is what gets her upset. <laughs> she sees these um, objects about a centimeter in length, lots of them, on the stool, um, and they're moving. Wait a minute. I thought she had diarrhea on what stool? So the the, the remnants, the pieces of <laughs> on the floating stool, small the, pieces the, of yes, whatever, whatever not, in there. She oh, notices okay. this in the oh, toilet. Okay, okay, and they're moving. And they are moving. They are moving. They are <laughs> mo- moving. They are motile. They're about a centimeter in length. The color. They're of a fairly uniform um, size. S- width. Width. Right. Width. They're fairly width. uniform width. Weird. Right, so yeah. think about that. They're not like they don't have one end that's small and then gets bigger or anything. It looks like they're not length. worms. Um, we're we're going to talk about that. <laughs> uniform um, with <laughs> you're leading the witness. Uniform <laughs> with yes, yeah, so they, they are. They are. Your Honor, well, I object. <laughs> they, they are. Um, they are thinner than they are long. Right, so they you know we'll say so they're, they're wormy looking. We'll say they're wormy looking. They're motile, motile. worming looking things. Okay, right. um, but she gives us a little more history, right? Um, yeah, because this isn't the only thing she's done. Uh, she's originally from the U.S. As we, um, she's she down there, Dutch, Dutch, right. but now she's of Dutch descent. Ah. Um, she but she grew up, born in the U.S., grew up in the U.S., um, and she's been participating in a lot of other activities in this area. She goes for hikes. Um, she swims in the local river, and she'll actually take off her shoes and be walking barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, around. Keep talking. She's been eating a lot of the local foods. But apparently she hasn't read our um, book. <laughs> she did not have it. it. We specifically asked that. She's very excited. She's She downloaded a free this copy already. Um, <laughs> she's going to listen to her she's, case. Yeah. <laughs> so she'll she'll have to listen and um, figure out how she thinks this all gets put together. Yeah, right. Um, there's, um, we'll get into this, I guess. We'll, so that's our, that's our HPI. When she eats these local foods, uh-huh. Are we talking about meat, vegetables, both cooked, not cooked? So the the lunch is this fairly standard lunch. With, so it's rice, beans, and some sort of meat, often chicken. So arroz, habichuela, um, carne, might be pollo. Throwing a little Spanish out here for our audience. <laughs> but they're all cooked. Um, all cooked. Um, the avocado is chopped up often and thrown in with this. Um, sometimes there'll be eggs and bread in the breakfast. Um, all sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Dinner, dinner is There's the same. There's yucca thing. and potatoes often at dinner, maybe some fried salami or some salted fish or, um, you know, different different things. Okay. Um, but it's all cooked, right? Uh, yes. Except for the avocado. Except for the avocado and uh, the, apparently that stuff she was washing, the mangoes. <laughs> right. Um, she's a healthy person before this. No prior medical, no surgical, no allergies. Doesn't tell us um, about any family history problems. Mm-hmm. Not on any medications. She's working as a as an aid worker. She's a recent graduate from university. Um, she's been living with one of the local families. Mm-hmm. Um, she um, she doesn't have any toxic habits. Um, Does she, she have AIDS. She is HIV negative. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we were mentioning dogs, cats, barefoot walking, local foods. There's pigs. There's chickens. <laughs> now we don't know if this is relevant, but. One month prior, um, there's a cat that lives in her house with the family, and it had kittens. She was very excited and spent a lot of time with the newborn kittens and the the mother. Oh, I see. Huh? <laughs> uh, she walks barefoot in the house as well as the river. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. Got it. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to tell you is where we finish it off. I guess maybe you guys can ask some questions. But um, a local physician is contacted 
and he's going to, you know, based upon these things in the toilet, he's going to, he's going to tell us something. Right. Um, and so she's going to end up getting, you know, treatment. He they're all, they're um, all the same size. Yeah. They're all, you they're know, all white. He didn't say he didn't say they were. I didn't say they're white, but he said they're white. Well, they're white. Say, let him say they're white. White. Um, white. So, so you know, a couple questions for our listeners. You know, what what might be going on here? What might these little white things be? Um, how would you make the diagnosis? How did she get whatever she's got? Um, how do we treat with whatever she's got? How do we approach this? You know, the timing doesn't make sense to me, Dixon. That's right, Vincent. All right, you're. Your detective skills are paying off. Uh, Daniel. So now, you're thinking, what, what what timing are you worried about? The mango and the diarrhea doesn't make any sense. Too too quick. It's too quick. Yeah. yeah. Unless, yeah. unless of course, she's allergic to mangoes. It could be, but the, the things in the stool are not. No, that's a red herring. That's a white herring. <laughs> it's a white herring. I think those were before she uh, ate we the mango. We would agree there. And uh, it's something to do with some of these other yeah, things. So you're going to have two things. Yeah, you could, but I think it's a previous thing. But Daniel, you said she went to a physician and he, he treated her, but she must have seen you as well. So that physician so, didn't so take they, care of things, right? So no, no, that, that physician took care of things. So she a, just told it's you actually Doctor Ricardo, who's the mm-hmm. guy. I would I would go down there. Sometimes we'd go like I don't know, two hours up into the mountains, we're already in the middle of nowhere, and then a hundred, two hundred people would come, and Doctor Ricardo would set up a consultation. Mm-hmm. I'd set up one, and we would just see everybody until you know everyone had been seen. And uh, he's top-notch guy, so he's going to actually be involved in the uh, identification and treatment. Uh huh. And so, and you know, an excellent, an excellent physician. So, uh. okay, I, that's good for me. Uh, are you okay, Dixon? You got any questions? Now, when the when the cat had kittens, did she play with them? Oh yes, she oh, was yeah. very could excited. Could not play with the kittens. They're so little and cute, right? <laughs> um, There's no litter box in the house, I presume. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, sometimes it's you know they like described where it's the cats in the house. Sometimes they like tie them up because they don't want them to go out at night. And tie like, them what up. is the cat supposed to do? Right? How do you tie know. up a cat? This is, right through the rope. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. This these is well inhumane. Be, these are well behaved cats. <laughs> well, that reminds me of a. When I was driving home from college years ago, we had a cat in the car, and we stopped at a rest stop. I think my roommate, he and I, were driving home. I left the back window open oh. a few inches. We had the cat tied up with a rope. We came back. It was hanging out the window by the rope. Good Lord. But it was alive. Good. Oh, my gosh. Actually, we didn't get very far when she wow. jumped out the window. And <laughs> <laughs> they're very, they want to get out, you oh, know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or they want to go where they want to go. You can't... You know, that cat lived many years. I'm sure. She was, she was a, you have nine lives. What do you expect? Boy, she lived a long, <laughs> long time. All right. It, are you good? Can we move on? Do you so, have any more questions? Do you like that? Is this a good no, one? No, I like this okay, one. I like this one. one. I like it very much. This is very good. I know Dixon likes this a lot. <laughs> I do. I do, actually. I want to tell you about a special offer from Drobo. Who is Drobo? You, you've heard of Drobo on this show <laughs> before. We've, we've talked about them a lot. They're storage systems for your computer's data. Okay? Now- Three simple questions will tell you if Drobo is right for you. Do you know someone who has more data that fits on a single drive? After dealing with clutter due to multiple drives and power bricks and cables, are you dealing with this? Do you need a simple system to store all your photos, music, videos, and other important files? So if you answered yes to any of those, Drobo is for you. It's a storage system that will keep your data safe forever. Longer than you, Dixon. (laughs) Once you're gone, the Drobo still remains. As then as what someone, is it going to do? <laughs> as long as someone pays the electricity bills, it keeps on spinning. It's right. built on a simple idea that to increase storage capacity, a user just needs to add another drive or to replace a drive with a bigger one. And they invented the technology to do this. It's called Beyond Raid. It's not a bug spray. It's a hard drive. Uh, did, did they write that or was that you? <laughs> It's me. I'm, I'm at Beyond Raid. Beyond, Beyond Raid. You remember Raid? I, 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 like, I like that. I like that. So you add a new. You can add a bigger drive. These are arrays of racks. It's a. It's a box. And you open the front. And you just put a new drive in. If you need a bigger one, you just put it in. Take out the old one. Put it in. Boom. Ten seconds it takes you to do this. If the drive fails, you just take it out and put a new one in. It's wonderful. How do you know this? Well, there are lights next to the drives. If it's green, everything is good. If it's yellow, it's fill- one of the drives is filling up. If it's red, it's full. You got to put a new drive in. If it's flashing red, the drive is dead. You got to replace it. It's brilliant. Dixon has a Drobo. Tell me, do you love it? I love my Drobo. You hug it every night, right? Mm, every other night. 
<laughs> it doesn't hug back. <laughs> they offer products with five, eight, or even 12 hard drive bays, which I covet. Maybe with this discount, I can get one. Who knows? Maybe. Probably not. I have to pay for college for the next couple of years. <laughs> you hook them up to your computer by USB, Thunderbolt, whatever you want, even Ethernet. You can do network Drobos on your home. You could do it throughout your home, access them anywhere or anywhere from around the world. They make apps that allow you to share the Drobos online highly securely. Amazing stuff. Things like photos. Dixon puts his photos on the Drobo video. I do. Digital photography, music, uh, all kinds of stuff. Now, here's the cool part. Drobo wanted to do one shot ad in December on Twip, and here it is. And now through December 31st, they are offering listeners of all of the Twix podcasts. That's Twiv, Twip, Twim, Twivo. Dare I say urban agriculture? Dare you. We're not going to have one this no, you, month. No, no, no. Just say it. <laughs> say it. Go on. I know you can do this. <laughs> all of those podcasts, 20% or more. That's $1 to $800 off the purchase of a Drobo 5N, 5D, 5DT, or 8 or 12 base system. 20% off. Now, I happen to know that the big ones are thousands of dollars. So that's hundreds and hundreds of dollars of savings. Like How do you get this? Cloud. How do you go to do this? You go to <laughs> drobostore.com. Get off of my cloud. Is that a song? Yes, it is. Hey, you, get off of my cloud. Right. Or the little cloud who cried. Drobostore.com. You, you select what you want. Order 10 Drobos. You're going to get 20% off. You put the offer code in. There's a discount code microbe 20 all one word microbe 20 when you check out you'll get your discount right there 20 percent so you have to go out and buy 10 drobos you should save thousands of dollars right <laughs> get a free Incredible. drobo every, every 10 you get one free that's right <laughs> we thank drobo for their support of twip happy holidays with drobo exactly all right we have some email we do uh, the first one is peter which we we started to read but he he is answering the case uh, of the man with AIDS, and um, mm -hmm. he had um, a fungating lesion, which turned out to be anogenital cancer, I think, right? Exactly. And now Peter is guessing he had cryptosporidium. Which? What was the what was the cause? Do you remember? Was it cryptosporidium? Do you remember, Dixon? Should I look the it old up? old searching our memory banks? Where's my Drobo? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to remember anything anymore. I just have a Drobo, and I put it on there, and then I look at it. Really? No, you're such a funny guy, Dixon. <laughs> well, we have to connect all the dots here. TWIP 121 was called a parasite without borders. Uh-huh. Now, the thing is, I don't put the answer in the show notes. <laughs> oh, that's, oh. That's a shame. <laughs> but what were the other guesses? Because they were right. Um, yeah, let me look at the letters here. Yeah, many of those people were right. Let's see. This is very sad that we don't remember. Uh, so uh, Shelby said cryptosporidium. Next guy, cryptosporidium. All right. Uh, cryptosporidium. All right. Cryptosporidium. All right. What did uh, Wink say? Cryptosporidium. I'm afraid. Should I mention they're all right? Yes. This was the cryptosporidium <laughs> man from, from Mali. Okay. So there That's you right. go. That's and right. uh, yeah. So he d guessed cryptosporidium and... Um, he got it, and he went into a long but discourse he was also about HIV it. Positive. He was HIV positive. So he had clade B, if you remember. Um, <coughs> so that's this Carposi's sarcoma that's causing his fungating lesion? No, it's HPV-associated. HPV, yeah. So he's from, the man was from Mali, right. and, and Peter says he does, Mali doesn't have a high incidence of clade B, but that's the predominant strain in America and Europe, so he probably didn't get infected in Mali. He got infected somewhere else, which mm -hmm. is something we also thought about. Okay. Right. Uh, Jonathan writes, Hi, hello, Vic, Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel. I found TWIP 111 fun and informative. I believe Dixon had mentioned some research that had been done to see if HCV could be transmitted by bed bugs. I recall an article that came out in 2015 that discussed Cymex lectularius as a vector of Trypanosoma cruzi. 111. Was that our bug bed bug uh, episode? Remember, you had a case of bed bugs, Daniel. Yeah, one so one ten was when we presented the bed right. bugs. One eleven is when we solved it. So this is a paper in American See, Journal. I, of, I remember everything suddenly. American <laughs> Journal. Of, American, yeah, but you've been looking at a drobo. That's not fair. <laughs> he doesn't have a drobo here. 
Well, he could. He could be accessing it online. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Bed bugs as a vector of Trypanosoma cruzi in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So there you go. Uh, since it wasn't mentioned on TWIP 111, um, I felt like throwing it out there for anyone interested. Also, as a public health professional, I have found all your podcasts extremely interesting and enlightening. I have noticed that your discussions oftentimes wander over into public health. Absolutely. For sure. Mm -hmm. Have you had many podcasts with epidemiologists or other public health professionals as guest speakers? I'd be interested in listening to those if you have. Perhaps someday there could be another Vincent Rack and Yellow podcast. This week in public health, pronounced TWIF. T-W-I-P-H, TWIF. And if it helps, I'll waive all creative licensing rights. <laughs> Thanks again for the great work. Right. Let's see, have we have had epidemiologists on TWIP? I don't think so. Right. But I, certainly on TWIV we had. Right. But we discuss it. Of course. But we don't have experts. We do not. <laughs> Although I did teach at the School of Public Health, and I've had epidemiology as a subject. That doesn't mean I'm Over an on TWIV, um, Jonathan, you will find... Some epidemiological guests. Would That's you call um, Dr. Lipkin an epidemiologist? Yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah, yeah. All right. A molecular epidemiologist. Uh, Daniel, can you take the next one, please? <laughs> molecular. So we are. Show me where we are. Niraj. Dr. Niraj. 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 I'm going to scoot Niraj. down here to Niraj writes. Dear doctors, this is Niraj, and I am mailing from the biotech hub in California, South San Francisco. I'm currently working at Sutravax Incorporated. In the past, I have written on and off about cases that get discussed on the podcast, but I won't make a failed attempt to guess the most recent case. I don't think I am confident about the diagnosis, so I will let the more informed enlighten us. <laughs> um, but let me assure you that this will never be a reason sufficient to not eagerly <laughs> wait to listen to the next episode as and when it gets released. Um, my little side, you know, getting stuff wrong. That's fine. That's how we learn. We that's learn right. more from our mistakes. We do. Um, on a separate note, I am mailing more for the immense wealth of knowledge this podcast is, having personally benefited from it. I can vouch to say that the cases, the facts, and the depth of science that gets discussed on this podcast is simply outstanding. I wish I knew about a resource like this when I was a lowly graduate student in biomedical sciences at the Rockefeller University. Wow. Although I doubt having the knowledge back then, I would have still used the New York City subway system so much. <laughs> In a weird way, I am always fascinated by the remarkably complex and beautiful world of parasites around us. Speaking from personal experience, recently when I wanted to gain insights into the complex world of malaria and how the parasite evades the immune system to do such an amazing job of infecting us, I listened to all the initial podcasts that Dr. De Pommier Am I pronouncing that correctly? Close. And Dr. Rack and Yellow <laughs> had recorded on the subject. Having listened, re-listened to quite a few of those, I must say that those are probably the best sources of malaria-related information that I have encountered. Certainly found it better than CDC. My goodness. The detail with which the life cycle of the parasite was discussed along with how disease progression relates to the clinical symptoms was particularly pleasing. Hmm. And for this, I want to personally thank and applaud you for this Generous labor certainly won't be the same without outstanding narrative of Doctor De Pommier. Oh, shucks. Are you? What's happening? Are you dying? Are you? No, I was just <laughs> okay. just overwhelmed with uh, humility. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure why we're going to be loosening you, but sir, your knack of telling stories is just God. as uncanny and penetrative as if Twip weren't about parasites. <laughs> I would have very much started sharing it with my two-year-old son. I am sure in time he will appreciate all the needle pricks that he has to suffer through to get vaccinated. Right. That we, we need to have that like an age. At what age can you start listening? To <laughs> but overall, I must say I appreciate, learn, learn more from your kind contributions and please continue to produce this amazing content and resource. And if you ever stop by sunny California to organize an event, I would very much be interested in being in attendance or have an opportunity to meet. So hopefully someday TWIP will make a trip to the biotech hub of California. Like it. Thanks for the knowledge, Niraj. P.S. Talking of malaria, please find attached a recent article published in Science where in the authors show the efficacy of counteracting malaria by oral, ultra-long-acting drug delivery mechanisms. Would be interested to hear the thoughts of the TWIP team on this. 
Dr. Griffin, I apologize for only praising the other docs in the podcast, <laughs> but without your case studies, the present production would be very lean and far less outreaching. Yeah. So please keep bringing in the case studies as they always present clinical manifestations that at times are bizarre, yet very enlightening. I forgot to attach the paper, but he sent a copy of a paper in Science Translational Medicine called o Oral Ultra Long Lasting Drug Delivery Application Toward Malaria Elimination Goals. Mm. All right. So but what they have here, they've developed a capsule that dissolves in the stomach and deploys a star-shaped dosage form that releases drugs while assuming a geometry that prevents passage through the pylorus, yet allows passage of food. So it, get, it gets hung oh, up wow. in the stomach. Yeah. Now, why is that good to be left in the stomach? Are things absorbed in the stomach? Some things. Some, Some things. things um, Alcohol. You know, there's, also, there's also an acidity there. I, I think it may also be the mechanical issue, is that you can hold oh. it there and keep it from getting passed out. So what they say is this uh, releases small molecule drugs for days to weeks into the intestine. Yes, yeah, so so they're it. actually being absorbed in the intestine, right. yeah, which would make but sense. they're releasing it slowly. And we generated formulations for controlled release of ivermectin, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, and then they used this in a swine model in this paper. And that's what that's what the paper is all about. I'd love to know when he went to Rockefeller for his. Degree. Look at the size of this. This is the size of your palm. Uh, that's that, incredible. That, so it doesn't get through the pylorus. It's about this big. It now, starts out of the capsule and then it and pops then it, open. Wow! Yeah, I'll show you the picture. It's very cool. Oh, my goodness! See? Oh, that's really wild. <laughs> and then what happens? <laughs> it stays in your stomach for a couple of weeks and releases drugs slowly into the small intestine. And I guess eventually, does it then fall apart and you pass it? Or yeah, I suppose it dissolves eventually. And they, oh, that's what they look at here. They they look at the dissolving of it. They have actually pictures inside the pig. They use pigs as a wow. experimental, and they show that it gets delivered sustainedly over the next weeks. Very interesting. What do you think of that, Daniel? I'm I'm slightly frightened. <laughs> I, I would agree. I mean, uh, something I like, that big. Yeah, I like the concept of um, lengthy drug delivery. Um, you know, and it's interesting. I think part maybe it's the novelty, maybe it's the being unknown, but seeing something the size of my hand that's going to um, <laughs> sort of explode itself into that size in my stomach and then stay there and then um, could interfere with the passage <laughs> of your food down into your small intestine. No. Well, it says it doesn't in the paper. I know what it says. Yeah, and I'm I'm still frightened. That's a big object. <laughs> well, when things come out of the stomach, they're pretty much liquefied, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this acid, it's going to dissolve. It's it's not like it's going to be, like, stuck in your throat and, you know. All right. Then why now, are you so, 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 Yeah, I'm still <laughs> frightened. <laughs> well, the question is, do we need a something that is released over the long term, which is what right. this would do? Is that right. important, Daniel? Oh, I think that's a challenge with so many of our medications. Okay. Yeah. So, Neeraj, let us know if you're going to go into phase one. I'd be really curious um, if you're ready, if your company is ready to do that. And, of course... Uh, when it's published, we'll talk about it. Right. Can you take Anthony's, please? Anthony writes, concerning TWIP 121, I don't know if it's central or tangential, but bats maintain a high body temperature only during flight. When resting, bats go into a torpor with a lower body temperature. Mother bats are an exception. Bats have their own subspecies of Chagas disease organism, um, designated uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, Mark and Kelly. Marin Kelly. No. Marin Kelly. Marin Kelly. That's exactly yeah. right. That's Just trying to pay you back for all no, the No, no, no. Me over. <laughs> not much appreciated. Much appreciated. It appears that uh, T. cruzi emerged from bats. Hmm. So the original hosts might have been bats to begin with. Opossums are both reservoirs and vectors of Trypanosoma cruzi. Opossums survive the infection. That's also interesting. A lot of other mammals do too, by the way. Are there echoes here of Hendra and rabies? Hendra is carried by bats. The native marsupials were not affected, but people and horses died. In New Jersey, there are, there are many reported cases of rabies in raccoons, skunks, and other animals, but extremely few for opossums. That's a good point. Mm. I wonder what's going on. Mm -hmm. Don't know. It's Don't interesting, know though, but it's all about animal reservoirs, right? Ain't it, though. Mm -hmm. And bats tend to be reservoirs. They're animals. good reservoir hosts. They sure are. Next one is from Adam. I started to listen to TWIP about a year and a half ago, and since then it's been almost the only podcast I listen to. <laughs> 
Now I've finally worked my way through the past episodes and recently listened to the latest one, not without a sense of accomplishment, I might add, but also with a slight feeling of emptiness. Now I must wait for the new episode. <laughs> I'm a junior doctor in Sweden interested in infectious diseases. I've been working in two different departments of infectious diseases, currently in Halmstad, south of Gothenburg on the West Coast. Later on, I wish to specialize in infectious diseases. Parasites aren't exactly common in Sweden, and hence this podcast is not particularly clinically relevant for me. And I probably could have spent all those hours on something more useful. But I, hey, wait a minute. That's a kind of an offhand <laughs> wait a second. comment, isn't it? I resemble that remark. <laughs> but he did put a little smiley there. I find them fascinating in this podcast, interesting and entertaining. However, if I could make a request, it would be to include more clinically relevant papers in the podcast. More, most papers you discuss are basic science, often about genetics or molecular science, and I find that not as interesting and sometimes hard to understand, and hence I sometimes struggle to stay focused throughout the discussion. Hmm. Also, a short summary about the article and its implications would be useful, as would a short summary of the main facts of the parasite involved in last episode's case. That's a good point. point. Um, So uh, before I read the rest, um, I guess today would have been a uh, more clinical paper that we did, right? Yeah. Because it's collecting specimens. More epidemiological. Epidemiological. I think the idea is that Daniel presents a case study and then we do a basic science paper. Right. It kind of balances itself. Yeah. But no, I actually take his point. I think we were better in the beginning, which we maybe should get back to, is when we present this is the case, we would say, now let's go through and give sort of a review for everyone. Sure. Um, I think we're, you know, I think we're getting to assume that our our listeners are at such a high level because they get all... But say, okay, so leishmaniasis is transmitted by this vector. And I um, mean, you know, a lot of that is in the right, emails, right. but we should right. make sure. We'll I think. do it. That's true. We'll do it for the case study and for the paper. Okay. Yeah. If you're we'll here. review. I appreciate that. All right. From January to September this year, me and my girlfriend traveled through Asia, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesian, Borneo, Sabah, and North and East Kalimantan, Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan. Wow. That's a trip. We had a fantastic journey. And apart from two episodes of Giardiasis in <laughs> Nepal, we didn't catch any parasites, at least that we know of. At the end of our trip, we visited Tokyo and the Meguro Parasitological Museum, and we had a great time. I can really recommend it to anyone interested in parasites, and you can buy a lot of souvenirs and stuff. And he attaches a few photos from the museum of worms and so forth. Many thanks. Keep up the good work. Adam in Halmstead, Sweden, where it's eight degrees, raining, and a storm approaching. Nice. Uh, I would just read the next one quickly from Rachel, who said, thought you would be interested in this. She sends a link to a website called Water Seer. Every day, more than 9,000 people die from a lack of water. Water Seer is a sustainable solution that provides safe water mm. where people live 24 hours a day without electricity or power. It's a wind-driven water purifier. And I know you're not looking at it, Dixon, but there it is. See? Right. Mm. Water Seer. Nicely done. Entrepreneurs, Dixon. That's what drives the world. Isn't it? <laughs> is that a reference to Tesla? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a cool website. So check it out. So Brandon writes. I'm going to let you read this because he, he didn't include me. I feel left out. Brandon does write. <laughs> and he wrote, <laughs> Dear Dr. Racaniello and Dr. DePommier, sorry, Dr. Griffin, <laughs> I'm a scientist from a large animal health company in the R&D division developing vaccines. I have recently discovered your podcast, TWIP, and have developed a high affinity for the robust information delivered in a fantastic manner. I have decided to to start on TWIP 1 and work my way through the podcasts to date. Thus, this question may seem outdated, however relevant to me in my time of reference. During my undergraduate studies, I worked for an animal emergency clinic in Iowa as a veterinarian technician because I could work full-time on off hours while attending school. There were five or six patients throughout my five years of working there. Oh, yeah, there were five or six patients throughout my five years of working there. There were dogs that came in for various other study issues while taking a stool sample or without stool, perglottids on its own. We discovered tapeworm perglottids, and once I recall finding a tapeworm, tapeworm eggs on a fecal float. After listening through the first seven TWIPs, I cannot determine, based on listening to the life cycles of each, what species it would have been because the dog tapeworm just does not seem to fit the descriptions based on the phenotypic nature of the dog tapeworm and the dog's life cycles. 
uh, lifestyles. For example, urban versus rural. Could these cases be from beef tapeworm or something entirely different? Pardon the seemingly simplistic question as my parasitic foundation is quite weak. However, I am leveraging my knowledge in immunology to strengthen my parasitic knowledge response. I look forward to getting caught up in the next month or two and greatly enjoy the case study of aspects of the more recent ones. Regards, Brandon. Uh, P.S. I have requested Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition as a Christmas gift and could not be more excited to start reading through it. And by the way, you can also download the free uh, PDF that fits onto your computer. So uh, the answer is beef tapeworms cannot infect dogs, even though dogs may consume lots of cystocerci from infected beef, they will not acquire the tapeworm. The difference between rural and and uh, and, and uh, urban dogs would not uh, rule out either um, Dipalidium caninum, which is the tapeworm, which I think he's dealing with here, uh, because dogs acquire it through the ingestion of fleas, and fleas on dogs, as you know, if you have ever tuned a ukulele, my dog has fleas. If you do, you'll realize that no matter where they live, they have the opportunity to acquire fleas. So fleas and dogs and feces and tapeworm eggs are all related to each other, and that's the life cycle that I think that you're looking at. Um, If you could take a picture of that tapeworm egg and then send it to us via email, we could actually identify it and tell you exactly what it is, or you can wait for your sixth edition to arrive, or you can download the PDF version now and look up the pictures yourself and choose which one comes as close to the one that you remember uh, having seen. So that's my best answer for you now because it's obvious that listening to your description doesn't help us decide which um, shapes and um, and the sizes of things that you were looking at. So I'm sorry that we can't go further with the analysis. Tapeworm proglottid, that's not enough. Uh, it would be if you had them. The Dipalidium caninum has two pores that the eggs can exit from. I see. So that's why it's called dip polydium. Okay. Dipolydium. Richard writes, Hi, my hero growing up was my grandfather, Dr. <gasps> Paul C. Beaver. Wow. He was one of the reasons I became a wildlife biologist. He died in 1993, but wondered how you might characterize his scientific contributions to the study of parasites, and if either of you ever worked with him. Dixon, do you know him? I did. I knew him very well. Really? I knew him very well. Talk yeah. a little bit about his He his was at Tulane. He taught at Tulane University. He uh-huh. was a, a pillar of parasitological knowledge. He uh, pioneered uh, the uh, Toxic Aracanus mm-hmm. uh, description of the epidemic that uh, later on, of course, was noticed in many other places. Uh, he also studied um, lots of other uh, exotic parasites. And um, the one that's carried by uh, crustaceans and shrimp, uh, and I'm blocking on the and angiostrongulus, uh, he also worked on that. He was a worm person to be, um, as most of his research centered around worms. Uh, public health aspects of uh, trying to um, trying to intervene with parasite uh, uh, transmission cycles in rural Louisiana. Uh, I must add that I was born in New Orleans, although I didn't grow up there. Uh, but uh, everyone knew Paul Paul Beaver. He was a very uh, precise parasitologist too. He was extremely concerned with uh, uh, linguistic rigor, and uh, was an editor for many of the parasitology journals. And uh, uh, you could tell whether or not he had had a hand in your article or not by the uh, <laughs> editorial comments that came back. Uh, but he was a kind man, and I, I knew one of his graduate students because she worked up here at Columbia for Dr. Harold Brown. So Paul Beaver and Harold Brown were very good friends. They were contemporaries. And uh, Eileen Pike was the woman that I began to assist when I first arrived at Columbia as a technician back in 1962. So Paul Beaver is a legend was a legend. I, I think he's still legendary, although unfortunately, you're right, he died in 1993. Um, his legacy lives on. He's trained many, many, many graduate students through his years at Tulane, and and they went on to accomplish a great deal of uh, important work in the fields of parasitic diseases and parasitology in general. So uh, we tip our hats to the fact that uh, his grandson is still uh, active, mm-hmm. alive, and, and curious, and wanted to know something more about his grandfather. I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time talking with him because we were of a different generations. Uh, obviously, I would stand in awe as he and Dr. Brown would 
trade parasite stories of their world travels. And uh, so he was, he was quite a man, quite a man, and, and earned the respect of virtually everyone who ever met him. So I have nothing but high praise for Paul C. Beaver and his works. And his book, um, Clinical Parasitology, was a, a foundation book that I grew up with and still have a copy of on my bookshelf, and I still look at it and uh, admire all the work that he put into it. So found, thank you for bringing that up. I found a couple of links that I'll put in the show notes. One is a dedication to him on his death from the Journal of Parasitology, where yeah. he, they say he was the last graduate student of H.B. Ward, the founder of That's the American correct. Society of Parasitologists. <laughs> That's exactly right. Oh, wow. And Ward goes right back to the German parasitologists that yeah. established the field to begin with ever. So the the lineage is quite direct. And I found a page at Tulane, uh, his contributions. They, uh, When he retired, they set up the Paul C. Beaver Fellowship to support right. graduate education. Right. And he said he was very generous with students. He refused to allow his name to be included on publications based on a student's research. Exactly. Had, it, had he done so, it has been said his 150-plus publication number would have doubled. Uh, at least. And he was here at Columbia. I'm looking at the same page. 67 to 76, the director of the International Center for Medical Research and Training. Hmm. Now, is that yeah. Columbia here? Must be I Missouri. I don't think it was here. No, different Columbia. Right. Columbia. You sure it's like Columbia? Maybe Columbia. It's with you. <laughs> okay, just checking. Yeah. Well, it might be a misprint. <laughs> All right, good, good, Richard. There you go. Dixon knew him very well. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say very well. No, I, I will take that back. If you think I said very well, I didn't mean to yeah, say that. Yeah, he said very well. I, <laughs> I knew of his <laughs> reputation. I knew his work very well. I listened to his talks when he, when he talked. I believe he was one of the past presidents of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the American Society for Parasitology. So uh, he was widely respected as both a, a basic um, parasitologist and a clinical parasitologist as well. All right. You can find TWIP at iTunes and microbe.tv slash TWIP. Consider becoming a patron of TWIP and all the other Microbe TV science shows. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out how you can do that. You can do, you can subscribe at Patreon for just a buck a month or there are other ways you can help us out to make better shows and do more. Please uh, send your questions and comments, your case guesses to TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center and also at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Always a pleasure. And welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad you'll be here the rest of the year. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier, well, he's also at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and also Trichinella.org and Living River, the LivingRiver.org, which is all about stream ecology for yep. fishermen. Yep. Fisher people. Fisher people. That's thank you, anglers, Dixon. Anglers. 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 Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. Find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I want to thank the sponsors of today's episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.